Preload on a babbitted tilt pad bearing is an added force that pushes down on the rotor. It adds stiffness to the oil film helping to control vibrations. As we will see, it can also keep the upper pads from nose diving or fluttering. We are comparing two 12-inch bearings for an exciter shaft. In the previous video, we went into detail on why the bearing from TRI Transmission and Bearing Corporation uses five pads instead of four or six. We calculated the load that is shared between the bottom pads. In this video, we will tackle two different types of preloading, assembled and geometric. The OEM bearing on the left uses a combination of assembly and geometric preload. The replacement bearing designed and manufactured by TRI Transmission and Bearing Corporation does not require assembled preload. It is designed to run with a combination of assembly and geometric preloads or only with geometric preload. Assembly preload is essentially a misalignment on purpose. If the rotor is lifted out of perfect alignment by the bearing, or if the faces of the coupling are not parallel, the adjacent rotors bend the shaft, putting a downward force on the lower pads. This preload force reduces the oil wedge formed in the bottom pads, increasing the stiffness of the bearing. Geometric preload is created by a difference in eccentricity of the bore to the rotor axis. If a bore diameter is machined greater than the rotor diameter plus the assembled clearance, the resulting assembled geometry creates a pad that has a narrowing in the gap between the pad and the rotor. This assembled geometry enables a converging wedge of oil that creates higher film forces than a pad, whose bore is perfectly concentric to the rotor. The geometric preload ratio is the ratio of the difference between machined and assembled clearance to the machine clearance. If the assembled clearance is equal to the machine clearance, then the machine bore is concentric to the rotor and the geometric preload ratio is zero. Here is a visualization showing a constant assembled clearance with increasing machined clearance. In our comparison, the OEM bearing is manufactured with a 10% geometric preload ratio. The TRI bearing uses a larger 50% preload ratio. As the ratio increases, so do the oil forces created by the oil wedges. The geometric preload forces are created in each pad, not just the lower pads as is the case with assembly preload. TRI uses sophisticated proprietary software to calculate the oil film pressures and oil film thickness in babbitted bearings. This software has been used successfully for nearly 50 years. The preload forces were included in the computer models of the two bearings for comparison. The force from a 20,000 pound rotor was analyzed. In the last video, we calculated that each of the lower pads in the OEM bearing carry 14,200 pounds. 200 pounds of assembly preload forces were added to each of the bottom pads. The lower pads in the 5-pad TRI bearing carry 12,400 pounds. No assembly preload forces were added to the TRI bearing. It should be noted that the steel backing of the OEM pads is much larger than the TRI pads, but the circumferential length of the babbitted bore is 64 degrees for the TRI pads compared to 60 degrees for the OEM pads. The model calculates the film pressure in the bottom pads of the TRI bearing to be 483 PSI. 451 PSI was calculated in the OEM bearing. The film thickness in the lower pads of the TRI bearing is calculated to be 3.4 mils and the film thicknesses in the OEM bearing are calculated to be 1.6 mils. Now here is a serious problem. The forces pushing outward on the upper pads of the OEM bearing are weak. As the model suggests and maintenance logs reflect, the upper pads nosedive or flutter. When nosediving occurs, the pads come in contact with the rotor and bounce causing vibration and wear. Because the TRI bearing has a higher geometric preload and lighter upper pads, nose diving does not occur. This makes the TRI bearing more reliable with good performance between scheduled outages. In the next video, we will look at the construction of the bearing and we will see why a combination of both the pad design and the lack of sufficient preloading causes excessive wear in the OEM bearing.